have three dangerous little friends, and their names are what, how, and why, and they have a cousin called What If. I've always been interested in asking questions because these little words have the power to change the world. Naturally, if you ask questions a lot, you end up sticking like glue to places that let you try to answer them. And then you end up celebrating your 25th birthday on repeat and still in some form of higher education. I grew up on a farm. If I say the word agriculture to you, your mind will probably instantly conjure up images of sheep gambling about in fields, cows lowing, rolling wheat fields, and big heavy tractors. And that's very much the right image at the moment. However, it is changing, both in ways which are visible and in ways which are less so. Some of those big, heavy agricultural machines are evolving into something smaller and smarter agricultural robots. However, it is not just the hardware which is changing, because the crops are changing too. Have you ever walked into a supermarket intent on a punnet of strawberries and noticed what the variety name on the punnet was? Have you ever wondered or cared what that meant? For hundreds of years, humans have done selective breeding. We've done it with dogs, which is why we have all of these wonderful breeds. And we've done it with crops too. But why? Well, if we hadn't done it with crops, we would not be able to support the population that the world currently has. Selective breeding has allowed us to develop varieties of crops which produce far higher yield. This is crucial when it comes to supporting a growing population on pretty much the same area of land. Selective breeding is also the reason that we have fruits which are big and plentiful enough that the dessert can be called strawberries and cream rather than just cream with a strawberry. But it goes beyond this. Different genetics are suited to different environments. It's why husky dogs with their big fur coats are not particularly happy in the Sahara. Similarly, with crops, where different varieties are suited to different growing environments. Let me give you an example. You may be surprised to learn that, at least in the UK, the Beatles song, Strawberry Fields Forever, is now a little out of date. We now predominantly grow our fruits in these tabletop systems, which are far more efficient. And the varieties which we choose to grow in a system like this are quite different from the varieties which we would grow in a field environment. But why and how did that happen? If you consider the farm, where crops are grown and picked to be the stage, I'd like you to consider for a moment what the backstage of farming looks like. Behind the scenes of crop farming, there are huge breeding programs where breeders are actively selecting and propagating varieties which meet our requirements. These can be things such as making sure that the fruit is big and fat and red and juicy, or it could be making the yield higher. We could be developing varieties which are more resistant to disease, or we could be selecting traits which make our farms easier to manage. And so, in a system like this, we have varieties which have these long trusses which hang down, so the fruits are not all hidden away in the leaves, and so they are easier to pick. Now, the process of selecting a new variety is still done very much in the same way as the monk Mendel, who started humanity off on its understanding of genetics. Two plants are crossed through flower pollination. The resulting offspring are grown up. The most promising of these are selected, and then the best of these are taken forwards. Now it's time for one of those little question words. How do we choose which ones are the best? Well, at the moment, this is done by breeders who have years and years of experience. They walk up and down the rows of strawberries, looking for plants which meet the particular physical requirements that they are searching for. And if they find one, they stop, and they taste a strawberry. This process is called phenotyping, describing a plant or other organism in terms of its observable traits, which are linked to its underlying genetics, just like blue and brown eyes in humans. Now, as things stand, 
breeders do a fantastic job. However, our demands are multiplying and changing. And I'm not just talking about customer preference. I mentioned earlier that agricultural robotics are beginning to be used on our farms. This means that in cases where the robots interact with our crops, such as harvesting, packing, crop care, or other handling, the crops need to not only be able to withstand these interactions, but in some way be optimized to them. Now, I find myself at the mercy of some of these little question words for the next few years. What if? What if we could develop an intelligent robotic system, so a robotic system coupled with machine vision technology, which could automatically detect which traits of a crop make it more suited to interactions with another robot? And how? How can we do this? This is an area of research called high-throughput phenotyping. In this area of research, we use remotely sensed data, so that means data which comes from a sensor carried by a drone or a robot, and we use this data to automatically quantify the physical traits of the plants using machine vision algorithms. An example of an early success in high-throughput phenotyping is the um, detection and counting of fruit. This is done by using various different types of sensors and cameras. Now, these sensors can be regular cameras, such as the ones on your phone. They could be multi or hyperspectral. Or they could even be reconstructions in 3D space, such as this. This is a 3D digital twin of a strawberry plant. And this is the type of data that I'm using in my research to automatically quantify the physical traits of the plant. So going back to some of the early successes in high-throughput th high phenotyping, with the fruit detection and counting, that's really crucial for selection trials, as we can select varieties which meet the high yield requirements. It also, interestingly, has commercial implications as farmers are, made, are able to make more accurate forecasts, which better enables them to schedule their labor and to determine if they will meet their market requirements. This is an example of how intelligent robotics is providing cognitive support to humans through the provision of data at a granularity which is otherwise unattainable. Another example of an early success in high-throughput phenotyping is the quantification of fruit shape which is important as it directly relates to the customer perception of fruit quality. Agricultural robotics is well on its way, and our crops need to be ready for new types of interactions. Just as we are entering the fourth industrial revolution, so we are entering the next agricultural revolution. Sensor-carrying robots can supply so much data and this gives us insights into information we never had before, which changes how we manage our farms and our people. And from my perspective, this divides the labor between what humans are good at and what robots are good at, so that people can spend more time on things which require the art of being human, such as deciding if a strawberry tastes good, musing connections between genetic crosses which have never been considered before, or trying to work out which of those little question words we should be asking next to make a change in the world. Thank you.